When he's moved in here many years before, he's a great friend and booster of almost heaven top party. Rod is a well-known blogger. He's an expert in understanding how to make telescopes and observations uh, understandable to amateurs, and especially bringing uh, technology down to a level that people can make decisions on what makes sense to do with time and try, mainly try, because you've got to keep on trying. So without further ado, ado I'd like to introduce Rod Belief. Thank you, Alan. And, you know, let me just say the obvious, uh, echoing what Bob said yesterday, you know, I always feel great gratitude. I don't normally name all the organizers and the leading lights and uh, the group that produces this wonderful star party because every one of them does a terrific job. I do always uh, single out Catherine Scott because she always herds me around like a silly little chick and I appreciate that. And... Uh, I always recognize Elizabeth for being so silly, <laughs> and that's okay. Anyway, I guess the, the elephant in the living room this time is we don't have Phil. We don't have Phil, and I've been thinking about that for several days, uh, as I'm sure you have, and I don't think there's any way we could not have thought about it, but you know, the way I feel today is that whether he's actually looking down on us or not, I don't know, but I believe he is aware that this, which was in some part his life work, is going on and it's going to continue to go on. Uh, and, and that he's aware of this and maybe he'll be back in the next go around, I don't know, but thank you, Phil. Uh, we're gonna do you proud from here on out. Thank you. Anyway, <clears throat> I was talking to your esteemed president last night and talked about various things and I won't go into all the dirty details, but one of the things that he asked me was, so what do I think is important in amateur astronomy, organized or not these days? And I said, you know, what I've come to believe, and I've done it all, I'm an astronomy educator, I've had one foot in the pro camp and one foot in the amateur camp for a long time. I've written books, I've written and continue to write for our favorite magazine, Sky and Telescope. But all that, subsumed and all that integrated, I think the most important thing is for amateur astronomy to be fun. That's what really matters. I mean, you can, you can do what you want, take it as far as you choose, do as much science as you want, but it should be fun. And when it stops being fun, you need to do something about it or you will leave our ranks and I think you will wind up being sorry about that. This past year, starting in January, I began to feel different about a lot of things. And I won't bore you by going into some of the changes that I've experienced otherwise. I'm just going to talk about astronomy and how I feel different about it lately, at least for the time being, because that's what we're interested in today. So let's have at it. And that's sort of the way I've been observing since about 2009. And like I said, I don't mean with a, a nice edge schmidt cassegrain you've got to look at the tripod. You know you're pretty far over the freaking edge when you've got to have a power strip uh, <laughs> tie wrapped to your, your damned tripod, don't you? I don't know how much of, you can, of that you can see, but this was about as close to an eyepiece as I ever got, which wasn't close, about 20 meters away, uh, with laptop running sky tools overlaid with next remote, a virtual telescope controller, and over here you had a display of the video coming out of a Malin Cam Extreme, and you can't see it here, but there's a, a, a digital video recorder rolling and God knows what else. And that was cool, that was great. That was one way I was able to observe basically 2,500 objects over the course of about three years for what I call the Herschel Project. And I've seen some cool stuff. You probably can't see much of it with all the ambient light. That's NGC 891, of course. And this, this past, uh, this past February, I knew things were changing. I knew things were changing a lot in every way, not just in astronomy, but in my life in general, in my outlook, in my philosophy. 
uh, and whatever. But I decided one last hurrah of the way I'd been doing things. I took a C11 and a big German mound and a ton of equipment and computers and everything else down to the Chiefland Astronomy Village. It was about 20 degrees in Chiefland and I'd chosen to tent camp so that maybe that, that was in some part the cause of my continuing malaise. But I did some amazing things. This was one of the broadest objects that I imaged. This is the twin quasar in Ursa Major, magnitude 16.7. You probably can't tell because of the conditions in here, but this is a gravitationally lensed quasar. It's one object, but it appears double. It looks like two. And if you come up here and look at the computer, you can see that I was actually resolving it into two objects. And that was, frankly, one of the brighter ones. I kept going past magnitude 17, and I only quit because naturally, once you pass about magnitude 17, the list gets awful long. And I was frankly amazed at what today is a relatively small amateur telescope could do, an 11-inch telescope. But you know what? It just didn't seem to be enough. It just didn't seem to be enough. Something was wrong. Something was wrong in astronomy for me. And I was smart enough to know, you better do something about it. I wanted to go back 20 years. Actually, I probably wanted to go back more like 40 years. But uh, My list, my to-do list, my plan of action and milestones, if you will, my POA and M, as we used to call it, in the engineering game. No computers. Not completely, as you'll see, but certainly nothing wired up to your telescope or connected wirelessly, which is even worse. Uh, no go-to. And I've never been one of the people who was against go-to. I embraced it thoroughly when it came in, and I still do. And I still recommend it to beginners because it's important that you get to see lots of cool stuff. I'm just saying, at this point in time, for me, and with that, no dig digital setting circles, which most of the time, most of the time, digital setting circles, of course, are a way to turn your Dobsonian or other telescope into a push to. Uh, another way to find objects in automated fashion. Maybe not even a telescope that tracks the stars. Uh, I'd find objects by star hopping with finders and star charts. And I would also stop carrying around four freaking jump start batteries. <laughs> Maybe one, you know, you know where I live, down on the Gulf Coast. There's so much do, I figured I'd have to have one just to run the do zapper, you know, the little 12 volt hair dryers that we use. And no cameras, no cameras. And astro imaging is something I've done little else than over the last five years, six years. If I wanted to record something, and I do like to have a memory to take home after a star party of what I'd seen, I would sketch it. And you need a simple telescope to begin with, and I needed a simple telescope. That was the worst Texas star party there ever was. That was 1997, that was the year that they had the big argument with the Prude family and held uh, the Texas star party at a site not f far from uh, San Antonio. What can you say about San Antonio in the spring? It rains there. Enough said. Uh, and I guess that meant Dobsonian. And I used to love Dobsonians. Uh, there was a period of time, rather brief, but a period of time where I kind of deserted Schmidt Cassegrains at the end of the 80s and, and, and was really into the Dobby way of life. Why not go back and do that again? This was what we used back then, the famous sauna tube, solid tube scopes. And there's a lot to be said for solid tube Zobsonians. A lot of people out here, and a lot of you in general, I'm sure, use truss tube scopes. And truss tube scopes are great. It's a way you can take a larger scope and disassemble it, put it in your car, take it to the dark side. But one thing I found was that a solid tube scope, like this humble Coulter Odyssey, was actually handier at home. Unless you can wheel out a truss tube scope or you can leave it assembled in your backyard somehow, uh, you're going to have to take it apart. You can't get it through a door, you're going to have to take it apart. And having to take it apart and reassemble it in your backyard means you'll never do that. 
Whereas a solid tube scope, you take the rocker box, plunk it down in the backyard, take the tube, plunk it down, and you're observing. Often little collimation needs to be done, and it's something, at least I, am much more willing to do. This telescope is old Betsy in her original form when I bought her in 1994, 12-inch Mead uh, Dobsonian. Uh, and I got this telescope back when I had a hatchback. When I was forced to upgrade to an adult car, a Toyota Camry, she wouldn't fit, so I turned her into a truss tube scope. But you know what? I stopped using her at home, and that was a shame. And I wasn't wanting to repeat the same mistake when I'm going simple. And they're big ones. That is my friend Tom Clark, late of Tektron telescopes, 42-inch. Uh, 42 inch. It doesn't look pretty, but it did work. Uh, it actually had go, there was actually go to on this puppy. There had to be. There had to be. There was no way you were going to wrestle that around the sky. Uh, the motors for the azimuth and altitude looked like grinding motors. Uh, it sure worked. It's the only telescope that's ever shown me the horse head nebula with direct vision showing the horse head shape. Still didn't show the color, of course, but it show, showed the horse head's shape. And there are little ones, like my little pal here, uh, an Orion Star Blast. And this is a telescope that I used to really like, despite the, the baby puke yellow color. Uh, there's, I guess, something to be said about having a telescope on a German mount. It can be more of a hassle, perhaps. But if you're really into making critical observations, the tracking's nice. The tracking's nice. I used this very telescope for quite a few of the observations I did for my book, The Urban Astronomer's Guide. So I, I certainly don't discount that some people would rather go here than uh, go to a Dobsonian, and there is something to be said for it. And you can often, often pick up a simple telescope like these for nothing. In fact, that's exactly what happened with this one. Uh, some guy called me, and I uh, said, I live across the bay. Grandpa's big scope is in the carport. Would you come and get it? So I said, okay. And I didn't expect much, but I found a near mint condition Criterion RV6 that those of us who are a little older, or those of you that are a little older than me, probably dreamed about back in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, you could use a Schmidt Cassegrain. Everybody loves the old Celestron Orange Tube C8. It tracks, but that's as high tech as it get, gets. It has a drive where you plug uh, an AC power cord into an AC outlet and it tracks, and when you're done, you unplug it and it stops. Doesn't get much more simple than that. Is a C8 too much to handle? Some people will think it, it is. This was actually a short-lived uh, version of the C5, Celestron did a while back, and I thought it was a great idea, and I'm sorry they got rid of it. It was rock bottom priced, and it had a little EQ3 maybe, EQ2 tripod. It was a sweet little scope to pick up in one piece and take out in your backyard. And let me say right here that another of my thoughts about simplifying my observing was that a lot of my observing would be done in the backyard. A lot of my observing would be done in the backyard, and it doesn't get much better than being able to pick your telescope up, carry it out in one go, and pick it back up and carry it in in one go. Uh, I've used this at star parties before. This is a, a Skywatcher AZ-4 mount. Uh, I used to be skeptical about a telescope like that, an F10 2000 millimeter focal length Schmidt Cassegrain, uh, working on a simple alt azimuth mount, but it worked fine. Uh, the kids liked it. I liked it. This was at our, I don't know if Novak does it or not, but we do International Sidewalk Astronomy Day every spring at an outdoor shopping mall. And this can't get much more simple than that. There are no batteries involved in that puppy. Uh, that was no TA that somebody threw out and I resurrected. And uh, it worked great. Like refractors, there's something to be said for uh, a wide field refractor. This is an F6, and that's maybe a little bit less useful. Got it. 
It's a, sorry, folks, but I don't have much patience anymore. Uh, I have used this for my simplified observing, but it's maybe a little bit less useful than I also have an F10 refractor, uh, simply because, like I said, I intend to do a lot of it in the backyard, and in light pollution, generally, a longer focal length telescope is a little bit better. You tend to use higher powers to spread out the background sky glow, and a longer focal length telescope means you don't have to use short focal length, uncomfortable eyepieces to achieve higher powers. This is a nice telescope. Explore scientific. And this is what I wound up with. I had sworn I was not going to buy another damn telescope. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, comma, I've got to say that the, third, the herd has been thinned somewhat. I've given away, I think, two C8s. I sold the fork mount next to our 11's mount, and this was too good a deal to uh, pass up. What this is, is a very simple telescope. It's a Dobsonian, obviously. It's a solid tube Dobsonian with a metal tube. Uh, pretty well equipped. 50 millimeter finder, two speed Crayford focuser, uh, battery powered mirror fan, very good balance system, an eyepiece rack, uh, a well figured 10 inch primary mirror, and I got this from uh, a place called telescopes.com for $499 shipped. <laughs> and I ordered it on Thursday morning and it was on my door Saturday afternoon. And it was not a waste, I didn't think, if I were going to go down this path because while I had an eight inch F5 Dobsonian, if you're going to go in my backyard <clears throat> Must mean something, don't know what. Must be the young it set. Works. Anyway, <clears throat> I don't know about your backyard, but I know I'm fairly lucky. Where I live now, I've got a zenith magnitude on a good night of about five or a little better. That doesn't sound spectacular, but I know a lot of you folks live with much worse. As you can see, I've got pretty open skies too. But even so, uh, having not dark, but decent suburban skies. I found that two inches, I, I was pretty sure two inches of extra aperture would often help. So that's my big 10 inch. That's my big 10 inch. Of course, uh, once in a while I have to get out my old friend. This, she usually goes to the club side. And usually when I take her out, I, I fudge a little bit and, and do use the digital setting circles, which go right there, sky commanders. Uh, get a good night out at the dark side. And yeah, there's the temptation. I want to see as much as I can see. I want to see it. I want to hunt tonight. And that's okay too. What's okay is me feeling good about it. See? That's 12. 12 and a half F4.8. But then sometimes I wimp out with little Yoda, the star blast. And it's obvious why he's called Yoda, isn't it? I don't know how much you can tell from this picture in this light. That is one freaking green telescope. But I love him anyway. The only drawback to him is that he's somewhat limited from my backyard. Uh, four inch F4. Uh, it's hard to get much magnification out of him. Uh, but when I don't feel like doing anything else, I'll often feel like taking him out and just maybe plunking him down on the patio table and taking a quick scan around. And you know, you can casually look at the moon and planets with a telescope like that. And gosh, how could you get much simpler? If you're really feeling the equipment, amateur astronomy blues, maybe that's it right there. Maybe that's it right there. Of course, you need eyepieces. Now, you may have eyepieces or you may not have eyepieces. Since one of the precepts I had, and which you may want to follow as well, is no computers, no drives, no motors. Uh, the wider the eyepiece, the better. An eyepiece with an 82 degree apparent field of view is better than an eyepiece with a 100 degree apparent field of view. Uh, as you know, apparent field affects the real field and the bottom line is that if you've got a 100 degree or an 82 degree AFOV eyepiece, you have to do less of the nudge, <coughs> nudge, nudge, nudge. That's been the gold standard for a long time. It's not anymore. You still can't go wrong with them. 
Uh, I sold all mine to a nice gentleman in Manila, Philippines, but I, I certainly cannot but recommend them. Teleview Nagler, 82 degrees apparent field, the original spacewalk eyepiece. First time I ever looked through one of these, which I guess probably wasn't until the early 90s some, sometime, it, it spoiled everything else for me. It was just so hard to go back to looking through what I thought were good eyepieces, like colossals, or even that eyepiece that everybody dreamed of having, the Erfel. They were just, you know, sorry, I was over them. Got more money, this is, this is the big dog. This is the 100 degree apparent field ethos. The only bad thing, 800 bucks plus a pop. On the other hand, uh, everybody spends more than that on a TV these days. In fact, I did. Uh, lightning struck my nearby and came in on the cable somehow. I don't know how, since everything's underground in my new neighborhood, but it took out my widescreen TV. And I was mad at first, but then I said, hmm, 4K ultra high definition. <laughs> Come here! <laughs> Xbox One, you're mm -hmm. Xbox One, you're coming my way too. It took out my Xbox 362. Uh, I've got the 13 and the 8 and the 20, and I can't say anything but, but wonderful things about this eyepiece. Just about the only way to justify it in your mind is think TV set, think expensive Nikon zoom lens, expensive Canon zoom lens, that's about all you can do. But I wouldn't do it again. Our old friend Scott Roberts, formerly of Mead and now with a company called Explore Scientific, was the first out the gate with uh, 100 degree eyepieces after Teleview. And he also came out with a line of Nagler-like 82 degree eyepieces. Uh, and after not very long, he began dropping his prices. I haven't looked recently, but a lot of his 100 degree eyepieces are in the $250, $300 uh, range, in other words, well less than a third of uh, an ethos, and I think the uh, the uh, 82 degree field eyepieces are even better as compared to the Naglers. And I did a shootout at uh, Chiefland, and I couldn't uh, couldn't tell the difference. I don't know if that would be you too. My eyes are not perfect at my advanced age of 43. <laughs> but I couldn't tell the freaking difference. And even if you could tell some difference, I don't think it would be extreme. And would it be worth the difference between $259 and $849? Probably not. Maybe it is. If you want to buy an ethos, I salute you. Is this from the Star Blast? Or? This? What did you use to, to compare it? I used a 22-inch star structure. This just happened to be the scope I had out at the time doing some DSLRing with. Now, a 22-inch star structure, uh, which I think if you're after a fancy dob, they're not simple telescopes. Go to and all the fixings. They're made of metal. You could do far worse than a star structure. Uh, buy cheap these days is my philosophy because the eyepieces that are out today were going through a golden age and uh, the hundreds that you can find are cheap and they're good and uh, somehow in my mind, and I know it shouldn't be like this, but it is anyway, cheap and simple are almost synonymous these days. Anyway, oh, this is a Pete Peterson Easy Binoc Kit. And it doesn't look like much other than a plumber's nightmare. Uh, those of you who are older than I am probably remember the pipe mounts that amateurs built in the 60s and 70s. This is a pipe mount binocular mount. And while it's very humble looking, I have never seen a binocular mount, and I include the most expensive parallelogram mount that works as well as that thing does, because it was well engineered. But the point to that is, one thing I have not mentioned is, if you want to go super simple, binocular. And, you know, it's, it's a world of compromises. 70 millimeter binoculars will show you a lot. Uh, is there something that will almost get you to a telescope without spending a lot of money on interchangeable eyepiece binoculars? There is. 
And once, it's our, uh, once again, it's our friends in the east. You can buy a pair of 100 millimeter 25 power binoculars for about $200 now. 250 maybe on the outside. These are mine. I don't use them all the time simply because they have their place. Th these are, would be wonderful out here. I have never seen the Milky Way look like they do through these puppies, simply because you're scanning up through Sagittarius with them, and with this mount, believe me, they seem to float in space in front of you. You're seeing all those little open clusters resolve, and you're even seeing some globulars like M22 begin to resolve. Uh, in stereo, in stereo, and sometimes it's a little freaky. Uh, like, for some reason, I looked at M31, and my eyes and brain told me that M31 was in the foreground and the stars were in the background. And it was pretty, but it was trippy. But anyway, this is another simple way to observe. There's no motor. All you have is a little sight. Once you get up to 25 powers, you got to 25 power. You got to have a sight of some kind. That is another way of simple observing maybe one of the very best ways for objects that benefit from 25 power and 100 millimeters simply because they really get out of your way. The mount makes them float in front of you. You're using both eyes. It's like there's nothing between you and the sky. So if you've never done this, that's something to think about. But anyway, back to eyepieces. This was the first cheap one, my beloved happy hand grenade. Uh, and it works decently well. They went out of production on these simply because everybody's getting into the 100 degree eyepiece game. <coughs> Mead, uh, William Optics, William Optics, that is Skywatcher, I think, or that's Skywatcher, and this is Lunt. They're all in the 200, $250 range. They all give you 100 degrees of uh, apparent field, and they all mean that you can actually s sit there and look through your scope without nudging along so much, and that, that, that just seems to be, a, like I said, a godsend. Also, if you're going to forego digital setting circles and motor drives and computers, you need what we used to call a finding eyepiece, something in the 30 millimeter range maybe for an F5 telescope. Uh, you don't want to spend much one on one because, like I said, part of the simple equation is that you will do a large part of your observing from your back 40. And if your skies like mine are not perfect, and I know most of yours, again, are not, uh, what does a 30 millimeter eyepiece in an F5 scope do? It shows you kind of this white circle with some smudges. But you want an eyepiece that'll at least let you home in on the smudge so you can put in a higher power eyepiece and dim down that bright white. This one, uh, I liked it. Came, oh, I forgot to mention. They also included a 30 millimeter, I guess it's probably an Erfel variant, two inch eyepiece with Zelda for no charge. And they threw in a couple of plossels too, inch and a quarter. So. But anyway, you want a lower power eyepiece for finding, and then you take it out and put it aside until you go on to the next object, maybe. How do you find stuff? This is the setup on Zelda. By the way, uh, I saw a sign out here. Somebody has come up with an automatic cut off your Telrad. Right next to you. Well, that's a good idea, but somebody, if you talk to him, mention what he needs to do is come up with a cut off, an automatic cut off for a Rigel Quick Finder. Telrad uses what? Double A's? I've left my Telrad on for like six months and didn't have to replace the batteries. But this little guy uses a button cell. You leave him, leave him on, you'll be crying, won't you, Elizabeth? She said, you damn sure will. I don't think I've ever used mine when I haven't left it on. Ah, I hadn't either, but I wasn't going to admit it unless you did first. <laughs> anyway, you need a finder, a finder scope or a unit power finder. Uh, this is what we used to call a BB gun finder, because that's where they originally what they were originally made for, BB gun sites, and the astronomy merchants picked up on them. Anyway, there are basically three finders that you can, can, should consider. A RACI, a right angle, correct image finder. You look through this and everything is mirror correct and upright. Very important comparing what you're seeing through your finder to the charts. Or the traditional straight through finder, which has the benefit it's kind of easier to get the telescope in the general area using a straight through finder, at least for me. I did not picture the 90 degree model, 
simply because it looks exactly like this racy, it just has a different prism. And that's its failing. Uh, a 90 degree that is not a racy, with just a standard prism, flips everything. And how are you going to compare what you see in the finder to what's on your charts? It's all mirror reversed. Some people develop a facility for being able to do that. I never did. A 90 degree non-racy finder is only, repeat, only useful for objects that are bright enough that you can just look in the eyepiece and they happen to be in the field of the finder and you can make them out. They're not useful for star hopping at all. You'd just be totally confused. Telrad. Telrad, Steve Kufel, who has gone on to join Phil in the great dark site in the sky, uh, was a brilliant idea. Sort of like a heads-up display on a fighter aircraft. You've got a piece of glass that acts as a beam splitter, a simple lens and a reticle and an LED, and it projects that reticle on the piece of glass, and it seems to float in front of the stars. Nothing could be simpler or better. Uh, nothing's mirror reversed. Nothing's upside down. What could be better? You just match the reticle on the stars that you see in your chart near your, uh, your object. Quick finder that I like so much is a lot like a Telrad. It's just a little fancier. It takes up less space. It has a thing here. Like the Telrad, you can dim the reticle or brighten it to uh, suit yourself. But this little control lets you pulse the reticle on and off. If you're going after uh, dim objects or dim stars, pulsing it off makes it easier to see. So that's, that's a darn good feature. You can get an aftermarket kit for a Telrad to do the exact same thing, but you have to pay for it. Uh, that said, the Telrad still has the best reticle, although I find the Quick Finder is more than good enough. The Telrad is, is a standard, a lot of astronomy programs, planetarium programs, you push a button and it'll display a Telrad uh, reticle on your star chart. Yeah, it's terrible, ain't it? Uh, well, I said it's compact and it can be pulsed on and off. There are others, I sort of like these. These are these Chinese finders that came along a few years back. What is super cool about them is they look good on my expensive apochromatic refractor, my fluorite refractor. Who wants to put a Telrad on or a quick finder on, you know, one of those babies? And you can switch to different reticles. But the problem is the geniuses who designed it made it too bright. <coughs> It's fine for aligning a go-to telescope. For actually star hopping, forget it. Unless you figure out a way to dim it down, paint some nail polish on it or something, I don't know. But above and beyond that, why do I still have the finder, the 50 millimeter Racy finder, which came with that Jumel telescope again, which was made by GSO, by the way, which came with it. Why didn't I just take it off? Again, part of the simplify equation is observing in the backyard, right? And it's easy to stop, star hop with a Telrad or a quick finder if you're at a dark side and can see lots of stars to star hop with. If you can't see hardly any stars, I uh, want to leave you kind of dead in the water. You need an actual optical finder that pulls in more stars than your eye can see to deal with uh, observing in light polluted areas. What I do is, you know, get in the general vicinity with this pup, Line it up uh, more exactly with this, and you know, it's almost like I'm the human digital setting circle computer. And I had not star hopped a whole lot, gosh, since the turn of the century. Got your finder, got your eyepieces, how do you find stuff? Well, like, like they say on the TMZ tour, and I took the TMZ tour when I was in Hollywood a couple of months ago, and it was great. Uh, you can't find uh, the star's home, homes without a map. Star charts and atlases. And what else are you going to do? If you don't have a computer or DSCs, you're going to have to navigate just like we used to do before, GPS in the cars with a map you got at the gas station. And I guess the baseline, and, and I really like it, is Sky and Telescope's Pocket Sky Atlas. It's, it's reasonably deep, magnitude 8, 1,500 deep sky objects. 
A lot of the time, that's going to be all you really need. It was done almost perfectly. It only has one real drawback that it makes me hate it with a passion. They put the guide to the constellations like three pages in instead in, of on the front piece. But can't have everything, I guess. The only other possible drawback to this is it's a little small, yay big. But the good part is you can stash it in one of your equipment cases, and it'll always be there if you forget your big atlas. It's pretty. Uh, the colors are right. They don't disappear in a red light. You can see it's got a slew of objects. It's just, you know, it's a little small, not bad. Very good compromise. Of course, this is the baseline, and it's been the baseline for how long? Crap, 20 years, 25 years, longer than that since uh, those of you who are older than I am uh, were buying uh, uh, the Beckvar Atlas. But, uh, Scalnate Pleso Atlas. I mean, this was the follow-on to that. The famous star, Sky Atlas 2000, uh, magnitude 8.5, 2,700 deep sky objects. That'll usually suit you just about any night. Especially if in, you're in the simplify mode and you're probably not chasing quasars. You might want to see a few NGCs and your old friendly Messier objects. I doubt you'd need much else. I doubt you'd need much else. And there's, of course, Uranometria 2000. It's considerably deeper at almost magnitude 10 and 30,000 deep sky objects, but it has a problem. Has anybody used it? What's the problem? There's a million pages in it. You're going to hate yourself turning pages. Yeah, but, you know, if i got to do dodges, I'll take out a laptop. But, I mean, it's a great atlas, and I have it, and I like it and all, but. I didn't, it didn't quite meet the simplify criteria. Flipping through the New York City phone book is not simplified. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, no, it doesn't. And, and people went even one step farther with Millennium. And Harold Bobroff as well, which does not cover the entire sky deeper than Uranometry, but it has some series of charts that are, that are deeper. When I want something deeper, I generally pick up Harold Bobroff rather than Uranometria. Uh, the only problem with Harold Bobroff, it's a great atlas. It came out of Oz, out of Australia, but it's out of print. Millennium is also out of print. There's probably a good reason for both of them being out of print. Once you really pass uh, Uranometria, print atlases become just much less, much less practical, whether traditionally plotted or photographic atlases, they become much less practical for use at the telescope. They're more important as reference. This is a new one that people are chirping about. I haven't seen it in person. It's called Stellarum. It's out of Germany. It has an English edition. Uh, it goes fairly deep, 9.5, 15,000 deep sky objects, large format. Its claim to fame is it has some of the features that Harold Bobroff had. It, like has ways of indicating if an object is visible in a certain size telescope, yada, yada, yada. And it seems to do that from what I can tell without making the charts too cluttered. Uh, Harold Bobrov had so much information in it, it looked like uh, army ants on parade. That's not a good thing. But again, there's no way a print atlas can compete with even a free computer program like Cars Du Seal which is why I tend to often use a laptop still, even if it's not connected to the telescope. Uh, you do wonderful things like plot a telrad on your uh, chart. Deep, this is the Atlas module of Sky Tools 3. And let's see, it says that star is, oh gosh, I can't read it without my freaking glasses. What does it say here? It says, uh, bunk magnitude 14.26. Now it would be hopeless really to produce a print atlas at magnitude 14.26. But that's just one of the brighter stars. You could keep going with this sucker. And of course every deep sky object, every little PGC galaxy that you ever thought of or never thought of uh, is plotted. So unless you know you're just going to be staying on the bright Messiers and brighter NGCs, uh, in which case, Pocket Sky Atlas or Sky Atlas 2000 are great. Make your life real simple. 
E if simplify still means you're going to go a little bit past that, probably a computer program is not a bad idea. But how do you put it all together? How do you find stuff? I noticed that one night. I don't think that's an actual plotted cluster. It's a question of guide. Yeah. But uh, I looked at it and I went, what? I looked back and said, should I be scared? <laughs> there it was. Uh, doing 2,500 deep sky objects and going to so many fields, you see a lot of weird shit. Pardon my French. Before you start, you want to find out what's going on in your backyard. Simplify or not simplify. What can you really see from the backyard? Uh, I was interested in what I could do from my backyard at the new place when I moved in. And uh, this was just a quick snapshot. No flats, no darks, no nothing. Just a quick snapshot of my sky with uh, my antique ST2000 SBIG CCD cam. And you see it, this was a short exposure. It turned up the old veil pretty well. So I was feeling good about myself. But the traditional way is with your old friend, the little bear or the little dipper. Uh, provides a good reference. If you're living in a, how can you tell you live in an ucky site? Like gag me with a spoon. You see Polaris and you see the two end bowl stars on a good night and that's it. And usually when it's they're culminating up top. If you can't see one of the, see these two, I suggest bird watching. <laughs> <laughs> that's just me, but we all love freaking astronomy, but there's such a thing as being an armchair astronomer and there's such a thing as beating your wooden head against the wall. Anyway. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to estimate. If you can see these two down here, if you can see these two down here, 4.95, 4.32, especially when the Little Dipper is straight across, you can do some real good. You can do some real good from the old backyard. Uh, and s nothing could be simpler than star finding by star hopping, uh, although it takes everybody a little bit of time when they're a novice to glom onto the idea. I know it did me. I had no idea what to do and there was nobody to ask. But uh, it's a process of drawing imaginary lines and shapes in the sky and that's all there is to it. You want to find uh, M101? Well, for starters, good freaking luck. <laughs> <coughs> but to find M101, for example, you make a near equilateral equilateral triangle out of the two end stars of the Dipper. Uh, you want to find M94, which you can see from your backyard. I saw this from my urban backyard many a time. It's a very bright galaxy called the Crocs Eye, a Seifert type or disturbed galaxy, uh, peculiar galaxy rather. Flat triangle with the two stars of Canny's, if you can see them. Uh, Want to find M81 and M82? You draw an imaginary line from beta on for the same distance, and that's where M81 and M82 are. You just keep doing that. These, by the way, are illustrations from my book, uh, The Urban Astronomer's Guide, and can't help but think it would be a help for y'all. <laughs> and they make great Christmas gifts, too. <laughs> Same with Leo, you want to find uh, the galaxies down here, M105. You've got this little star, 53, Leonis, which may be visible in your backyard, maybe not, but I could usually make out 53 uh, vaguely, very vaguely on a good night when it was high in the sky from my urban backyard and it's fairly easy to see in a finder. M105 lies about halfway along the line. You've got also M95. M96, just a field or two over. Uh, and that's all there is to it. You just keep drawing uh, drawing shapes in the sky. This is appropriate for uh, this time of year. If you hadn't looked at good old M10 and M12 yet, be sure you do an Ophiuchus. Make a square with these. And M10 is at the corner. You just move up for M12. Beautiful sight. Easily visible <coughs> from... Maybe not the worst, maybe not from downtown D.C., but just about the worst uh, suburban neighborhood I can think of. You should see a sign of M10 and M12. 
and just keep doing it all across the sky. Nothing to it. You don't need a triangle to find M8, I hope. If you need, if you need to look around for M8, you probably, yeah, you ought to take up bird watching now. But you might need it to find M22. So you see the same process, just draw a triangle. There's nothing to it, there's no secret to it. It's just getting the idea and orienting yourself with your telescope and your finders. That's all there is to it. It's easy. Of course, you can cheat without computers. And the way we cheated for years and years and years, well, those of you who are a lot older than I am back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, with analog setting circles, right ascension setting circle and a declination setting circle on a, an equatorially aligned, aligned mount, a Schmidt cast grain, a German mount, doesn't matter. Uh, you align it to the pole, the north celestial pole, as you will, an equatorial mount anyway. You set this to the current. Uh, right ascension of a star of known right ascension. This should be set, the declination circle is normally set at the factory, doesn't have to be messed with. And theoretically, you can move the telescope until the pointer, pointer is on the RA of the object you want, and on the declination of the object you want, and it'll be in the eyepiece. But it's just theoretical, see? If it weren't just theoretical, there'd never have been go-to telescopes and digital setting circles. These can work very well in observatory telescopes and some of the older professional instruments I've used, they work very well. But the advantage to a large professional instrument in an observatory is it's permanently mounted, it's exactly polar aligned, and the setting circles are very large, so each division covers a lot of ground, so it's easy to get it precisely set. For an SCT, uh, not as easy. For those little circles you see on the small German mounts, forget it. With an SCT, I could get within, often get within about a degree of an object with, uh, with analog circles and tuning with a finder. They were, they were a help. Sometimes it would actually be in the field of a low power eyepiece, but it would get me in the neighborhood anyway. But the Dobby people aren't, uh, aren't left out. This is something I did as a fun project some years ago. Oh, unfortunately, this is the yellow telescope. After the Urban Astronomer's Guide was, re was written, an ATM friend of mine said he wanted to make it into a beautiful telescope of cabinet maker quality. And he did. I don't know that you can even tell from this, uh, this picture, but it's a beautiful telescope. There are only two like it in the whole world. There are some similar ones, but I don't think any that look exactly like it. And Somehow I just wanted to start tricking it out like a hot rod. May it put a secondary heater on it, yada, 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 but what if it could have setting circles? Uh, I went down to Harbor Freight and I found a position angle indicator. Had a magnetic base, stuck right on the truss tube, and uh, that took care of altitude. Azimuth, I found a, a website that would plot uh, an azimuth circle for you. I, uh, Yuck Yuck had a big plotter of high quality at work I could use in those days when I worked for Northrop. Printed it out. That cool pointer is uh, the tine of a plastic fork with the end painted black. <laughs> I got this reading lamp from uh, 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 Wally World and covered it with uh, red cellophane from a valentine some nice person gave me that year. And uh, it works. What do you need to be able to use altitude and azimuth circles? You've got to have a computer program, of course. Something that will, that will convert the RA, the right ascension and declination coordinates of an object, into current altitude and azimuth, right? That was always the drawback to DOB setting circles. Back in the day, people figured out ways to program HP programmable calculators uh, with a little program that would do that to some extent. But it was never really practical until the cell phones came along. And you know any of the programs you get today, like Starry, uh, Starry Night, uh, Sky Safari, you just click on an object in your phone and it'll show its current altitude and asthma. Move your scope in altitude and azimuth until the pointers read that current altitude and azimuth and the, the object will be uh, probably a little closer than it would be with the analog circles 
on the Schmidt cast grain simply because you got much finer gradations, especially on your azimuth circle. The only drawback is because of the geometry of the situation. Uh, if your telescope is not precisely level, the closer you get to zenith, the farther and farther off objects will be. But it's relatively easy to make some kind of little leveling feat for a smaller knob or put it on a little leveling platform. And I did that and I've had a lot of fun with it. On those nights in the backyard when it's hazy but you still want to get your butt out from in front of uh, watching TMZ and see some stuff in the sky, but it doesn't look very practical to use even a 50 millimeter finder, uh, these will run down some objects with you. I've seen 40 or 50 objects in my backyard on a night like that just using those little analog circles. They cost nothing. Well, they cost $4.95 for that angle indicator from the Harbor Freight. I need to stay out of Harbor Freight. <laughs> I'm going to buy a Chinese drill press one of these days. I'm probably, <laughs> probably going to regret it. And like I said, uh, once before I went back to visual observing, okay? But I'd go to a star party or even the dark side, and I'd leave and I'd feel let down. It was like I'd imaged for so long that I just felt like I needed something to take home with me. But I decided to go back to sketching like I did as a very young man in the late 80s. Uh, and I, uh, I suggest this for a number of reasons. It's the most simple form of imaging there is. It's time tested. It's still valuable for a number of reasons if nothing uh, other than the fact that if you sketch something you see in the eyepiece, you will really freaking look at it. You will learn these objects if you draw them much better than you have to go, yeah, that looks pretty cool, Elizabeth. What do we look at now? And you go on in two minutes more. Uh, but more on that later. Before you even get to the drawing stage, you have to have stuff to look at. If you don't have stuff to look at, what are you going to do? Well, this time of the year, you're going to go outside with your telescope. You're going to look at M13. You're going to look at M57. You might look at M22. And you might look at M92, maybe. But then you go, well, I think I've seen it all for tonight. I wonder what's on TMZ. <laughs> and you go right back inside. So you need a project. You need an observing list. I use the computer program Sky Tools 3 or another one called Deep Sky Planner to make lists for me. They're big database programs that assemble lists of objects, uh, taking into account things like their magnitude, whether they're visible at the current time, so on and so forth. You don't have to do that. You can do what I used to do uh, when I was a very young man back in the late 80s and sit with Burnham's Celestial Handbook and a steno pad and make lists of objects you thought were cool. But Again, even if you're simplifying, guess what? Sometimes these freaking computers do make things simpler. For all their irritations, sometimes they do. Uh, and there are just so many things to recommend Sky Tools and Deep Sky Planner. Sometimes, especially when you're going visual, it really helps to have at least an idea of what the hell you're looking for and this program, you can click a button, and it will download images of every object in your list from the Digitized Sky Survey. That is the Digitized Palomar Observatory Sky Survey uh, automatically. And if you haven't done a lot of visual, especially from a compromised location, get your bag of tricks out. I know you've all probably heard all of these, you know, uh, starting with, you know, you look at M87, and what does it look like? What does it look like? What does M87, the great galaxy in Virgo, look like? It looks like a fuzzy blob. It looks like a little round spot. That's not all there is to it. Like I say, uh, it's in the heart. When you know that <clears throat> that spot has a mass of over a trillion suns, and is letting off a great huge jet against the black of intergalactic space, it means more to you. So maybe it's not a bad idea to pick out old Burnham's handbook once in a while and read what he had to say about some of these objects, and, or however you do it, inform yourself about them. Uh, you can see plenty in the average backyard, enough to last you a lifetime, won't look as good, but you'll have seen plenty of cool stuff. Wait for the best times to chase the hard ones. Uh, that was something I had to do. I'd tasked myself with seeing all the Messier 
for the Urban Observer's Guide for my urban backyard. They included M74 and M101. And it took me quite a long time to do them, because I, but I was able to do them. How I was able to do them was wait for those special nights, you know, like the wintertime or the early spring, a front's come through, cleanse the sky. Wait for the object to culminate. Wait for it to be in the best part of the sky. Do all those things and you'll eventually probably be rewarded. <coughs> oh, one thing that people <coughs> neglect horribly is ambient light. There's nothing you can do about the general sky glow. But if you could just get a little bit more dark adaption, you'd see a lot more. And what's preventing you from getting more dark adaptation from your, from your pupils dilating a little bit more is ambient light. The light from your back porch light, your neighbor's back porch light, the street light over there, if you could do something about that, you'd see a lot more. You can do something about those things. This is what I've done more than once. What that is, is a stage flat. Uh, I didn't paint this one, so it was easier to see what it was. It's simply a frame of one by fours and a one by four stand. Paint it black, black loose light, uh, latex paint. Move it around as you see fit to uh, block out ambient light. May, make a few of them. You'd be amazed at how much more you see. And while that makes things a little bit more complicated maybe than you'd like, if you've got a really nasty backyard, it could be worth it. And use the observing tips too, you all know. Averted vision, look away instead of right at. Did you know the jiggle the scope? Because of evolution, uh, or whatever, uh, we have easier, an easier time seeing things that move. That was simply because our ancestors needed to see Mr. Leopard creeping up on them. If you jiggle the scope a little bit, sometimes you can make out that very dim galaxy. Uh, higher power, as we've said, uh, spreads out the background sky glow. Keep after things like I did M101 and M74. Week after week after week after week, don't see them, come back next season, keep going. You'll probably never see the horse head from your backyard, but you will see M101 and M74, at least a trace of them. Have you heard of this one? You haven't heard of that? This used to be the craze at the Texas Star Party. Somebody, I think it was Barbara Wilson, or maybe her friend uh, Larry, Larry Mitchell. Uh, he was the guy who contributed the Mitchell Anonymous Galaxies catalog to the old program Megastar. But anyway, they did some reading. They found out that the, in the Battle of Britain, the RAF pilots ate bilberry jam because it improved their night vision. So for a short while, there was a huge craze <laughs> on, for bilberries and bilberry jam amongst deep sky observers. Did it help? Eh, probably not. Maybe a little, but it certainly tasted okay. Almost anything's worth a try. Back to your imaging method. Uh, again, I want a souvenir. I want something to remember that. I want, you know, you go back 20 or 10 even years or even five and look at what you observed on a certain night and it kind of just adds another whole dimension to the experience. Sketching's easy. There's nothing to it. You don't have to be an artist. It's pretty hopeless to try to do a finished drawing at the eyepiece, even under the best circumstances. What I do is I take notes. I plot the stars with their sizes, at least roughly indicating their brightnesses. I generally use contour lines for nebulosity, and uh, I make plenty of notes. That's step one. You know, we'll also write down that and more of the vital statistics. Next step is home in the morning. It's vital that you do it the next morning while the image of what you saw is still fresh in your mind. You'd be surprised the next morning, think back on your observing run, right? you've really got an image of just about everything you saw pretty much locked in there. So start your drawing. Do a fresh field circle. Use nice drawing pencils. Use blending stumps. You get all this from the art store. What I like to use is spiral bound sketch pads. That's step two. Make as nice a finished drawing as you can. Integrating both your notes and what you freaking remember. Strive your best to not add details that you didn't actually see. Try not to add details that you remember from photographs. Try to work with what you remember from the night before. Make a nice finished drawing. That's only step two. Step three, scan it into the computer. 
use a program like Adobe Photoshop or whatever. You can use the airbrush to make nice, pretty, soft edge stars. You can use its tools to do some nice blending of your nebulosity. And then maybe even print it out. Uh, there's some of those programs like uh, uh, Deep Sky Planner allows you to attach your drawings to its files, like you bring up the information on M82 and your drawing will be right there with you. Man, that's cool, but I do urge you to print them out. Can you overlay it on a picture? Sure you can, and people do that. People do that. People Very do nice. do that. Once you get something on the computer, you know, again, they don't always simplify, but sometimes they do think, make things, like I used to say in a former life, more, better, gooder. More, better, gooder. I'm having a ball again. I'm not saying, uh, you may find out through the grapevine that I appeared at the Peach State Stargaze with a C11 and a load of video gear. You know, part of the equation is that it has more to do with just than my general feelings about life in general and what I'm kind of, the, the kind of stage of life I'm on at the moment. It also has to do with lousy weather, bugs, heat, and clouds. Uh, when it's like, that, uh, I can convince myself to pull out a dog. When it's not, I'm watching TMZ. And don't get scared out there, okay? <laughs> tell your friends. Tell all your friends. I am the kind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Let's find out. <laughs> Ask as many questions as you like. This is one of those talks that's maybe a little bit more straightforward and there's not much else to say, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Uh, you were talking about the ethos, which is telling you the best of the best. How about relative to like the Beatles and the Blue Lights? And well, the problem with those is, and, and I, I'm not totally against them, you'll see that I've still got some panoptics hanging out in my eyepiece case. The problem with the delos and the delos is they ain't 82 degrees and they darn sure aren't 100. That's what kills them for me, especially for this. Simple daub, no tracking. I want 100 degrees. If I can't get 100 degrees, 82 degrees will we'll just have to do, I guess. Yes, Elizabeth. So you talk a lot about the charts and they go in deeper. I, um, I've been helping my daughter paint her eyes because she's an eye disguise and I pulled out the planisphere. Do you remember that? Yeah. Circle yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now I've kept using it. It's like yeah. the opposite of going deeper because you know you can line up to see exactly. Oh what's yeah. Be there yeah. Exactly. No doubt about it. I love that sky and Alex that you put up there. I used that exact page last night to, to start. I uh, But sometimes I'm like, well, where is that exactly? I actually, as a matter of fact, in the astronomy course that I teach at the university, we I do take them outside and I take one night and go over sort of what I under the charting part of what I gave you tonight, sort of those same things. And I teach them to use a planisphere. I'd love it to just start and, and the out. one that everybody likes the best is my old friend David Levy's enormous, gigantic planisphere. Have you seen that one? Uh, oh, actually, I think I might have had it yeah. built right yeah. now. It's like this yeah. big. It's enormous. Yeah. I really favor that one. But yeah, you're right. Having an an simple analog computer like a planisphere is a big help. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, these paper atlases don't uh, handle uh, comets very well, or planets, or uh, even supernovae. Well, they don't handle them at all by our standards, but back in the day, when I was a very young man in the late 1980s, what we do is we just look up the comets ephemeris and take a pencil and plot them on the atlas. See, that's one of the strengths of a paper atlas. You can write on the sucker. You can write on the sucker. If you were, if I were to give you my Sky Atlas 2000 or uh, my copy of uh, Scalinate Pleso, which I obviously bought many years after it went out of print, haha, -ha, you'd find that every page is just loaded with notes, comets, uh, planets, everything else. Plot your comet here, plot your comet here, plot your comet here, connect it with a line. Easy as falling off a log. You have to do some work, so you have to think in your mind. It becomes a case of, is it simpler for me to look up the ephemeris 
of this comment and draw some pencil marks, or is it simple to try to figure out how to download comment ob ele object elements in my computer program and read them in and figure out how to plot it with the, you know, it depends on you. Depends on you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when you're using analog setting circles, yes. does that really do it? How can you tell whether you're positive or negative at an Well, and that's one of the things, <clears throat> I should stop doing this, I guess. <laughs> I should freaking stop doing this. But I still teach analog setting circles to undergraduate astronomy students. There used to be a thing like, well, they go on and become graduate astronomers and there's still some professional observatories where they use it. Well, not true anymore, but I still teach it anyway because it teaches you something about the sky. And the way you figure it out is, <clears throat> yeah, there's no plus or minus, is there? Well, what you have to remember is if you're on the north side of the celestial equator, it's positive. If you're on the south side, it's negative. And I wish I had a telescope here to show you, but with a fork mount telescope, you start out pointed at Polaris, and you move it, move it, move it, move it, move it. And there comes a point where it's perpendicular to the fork arms. And if you were to move it in right ascension, that defines the celestial equator. And you just have to remember, when you're moving your telescope south, and it's perpendicular with the fork, and you keep moving it more, you're in the south celestial hemisphere there. I could explain it to you so much better if I had a telescope. But, you know, it's just, you have to get it in your, the secret to it, figure out in your mind where the celestial equator is in the sky. By doing this, point this arm, this hand at Polaris, and make a 90 degree angle, and this defines the celestial equator, and once you go past that with your telescope, you're in minus territory. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, exactly. And, and, and then, sort of, I mean, you've got a long way to go, but sort of, I, I see a man. Darn right I do. Coming to a place where, you know, you, you are, you're discovering the joy of astronomy. Is that what you're trying to say? I don't think, almost. I don't think I ever lost my love for astronomy, but you're right. Maybe a little of the joy went out of it. And maybe it was because of the particular spot in my journey where I am. Certainly, all of you are not in the same place in your journey. But there may be other reasons that you might want to look at simplifying uh, astronomy. You know, number one is if you're bored with it. Everything else in your whole life is unicorns, butterflies, and rainbows, but you're bored with amateur astronomy. It may be the equipment malaise, and just doing things a little bit more easily uh, might be a big help. Or it may be just this time of year, I don't know how it's been up here, but just about every moonless night it's been cloudy or raining. And when it's not, it's extremely humid and there are nothing but mosquitoes. Or you may be like me, that you're a place where you're thinking about the larger issues, where your journey has taken you to a place where you begin thinking about, well, I love the universe. I've loved looking at the universe, but now I want to know exactly where I fit into it. If you come to that place, you know, this could be a help as well. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, what, uh, you were talking about a binoculars kit. What was the, the name of the measurement? Pete Peterson. Easy, just remember, it's so simple. Easy, as in Echo Zulu, easy binoc mount. Easy binoc mount. And what he does is he sells you a kit of some custom-made parts. Then you go down to the pipe supply house or Home Depot, your choice, and buy a galvanized pipe to finish it. The real value of what Pete Peterson does is his engineering skills, his design skills, and his instructions. Other than that, it's like what you old fellers used to do with your pipe mounts, you know, take valve grinding compound and put it on threads. And, you know, I got it all over the living room. And, oh, well. Let's not go into that. Anything else? Let me say then that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you weren't in here, if it's clear, I'll be wandering the uh, observing field. And if your Schmidt Cassegrain's out of uh, kilter collimation-wise, I'd be happy to show you and your friends how to do it.
If it's raining and clouding out there at 9 o'clock, come back here if you've a mind. I have a presentation on collimation I'll run, which can at least answer your questions, if not show it to you hands on. Oh, man. Thank you. Huh? Nice Went through this. And okay, thank you very much. You're trespassing, rat, bruh. That just kills me. <laughs>